Okay, so it's 11. Do you have any housekeeping to do or can I just get right in? I uh, just uh, welcome Amy June. Thank you so much for joining us here at WebCamp. Great. Um, so you are at Accessible Media. Um, last year I presented um, a session about um, auditing your website for health. And I talked a little bit about accessibility, but this is more of a deeper dive than last year's where I talk about specific things. And before I start, I just want to do a little bit of housekeeping. If you need transcriptions, Zoom has them. There's a little CC button at the bottom of your toolbar that you can hit and enable transcriptions. And because there's transcriptions, I'm not gonna turn on captioning on my slides. Normally I would, but you have that resource. Um, there's a link in chat for my slides. Um, remember the code of conduct applies. And I do have images in my presentation, but most of them are decorative. If they do add any value or content to the presentation, I'll be sure to describe them, but most of them are just, um, just images to, to add a little bit of flavor to the site. Um, and then as far as questions go, I think questions work better for me at the end um, because it's really hard to navigate all the windows and answer questions as we go. And then I have a little bit of a hearing loss, so it's easier for me to close the screen and, um, and read text or uh, lip read or something like that. So I will get started. Uh, like Carol said, my name is Amy June. I am... Um, the QA engineer and the open source ambassador for Canopy Studios. Uh, but who am I to be talking about accessibility? Uh, I'm a hospice nurse by trade. So I'm an advocate because I, during my 25 some odd years of nursing, I experienced firsthand how different people experience the web in different ways and what challenges and barriers they had um, when it came to uh, digital accessibility. I help organize and market um, a meetup every month called Ally Talks, that's A11Y. We are a virtual group that get together and we have speakers that come on and talk about um, all things accessibility, not just Drupal or WordPress, but it's pretty uh, digital asset agnostic. I mentor for, for Drupal. Um, I'm a core mentor, so I help people get started with giving back to open source. And then I'm on the community health team for the community working group in the Drupal space as well. And then as far as um, where you can reach me, uh, Volkswagen Chick is my handle across all the medias. And I say that now, and I'll say it at the end, because I talk a lot and I get excited. And sometimes I don't always have time for questions. And so Volkswagen Chick on LinkedIn or Twitter or um, in the Slack spaces works really well. I work for Canopy. Um, we're hiring um, all sorts of Drupal and WordPress jobs. I know that this is a, a, a CMS agnostic uh, community. So we're hiring for Drupal tech leads, technical engineers, all sorts of neat things. Um, and you can go to the website and check that out. So now to kind of get into the meat and potatoes about accessibility. Why do we design for accessibility? It's the law, <laughs> you know, that's a good reason why. But we also want to make sure that we include a wider base for our content, you know, whether or not we're selling products or giving services, we want to make sure that we don't exclude people from using those products and services. And um, accessibility is really essential for developers and organizations that want to create high quality content. According to the CDC, and these numbers are always changing, um, 26% of people living in the United States live with a disability. And if you break that down, that's one in four people. And we're not just talking about physical or uh, permanent disabilities. We're talking about situational disabilities or um, temporary disabilities. So that's something that boosts those numbers a little bit. So at any given time, one in four people are living with a disability. And remember, as we get older, we all become a little bit more disabled with time, our hearing, uh, you know, suffers, our eyesight deteriorates. Um, and COVID um, sheltering in place is a good example of situational disabilities. You know, there's, there's kids running around, there's noise going on. You don't always have the quiet anymore. So, you know, you need things like captioning or transcripts. Um, you know, you're sharing your computer with your family. You can't always find your mouse, you know? So thinking about how people use the internet navigating um, with the keyboard. And again, you know, not every disability can be seen. Uh, dizziness, 
cognitive dysfunctions, brain injuries, fatigue, you know, as well as those um, uh, things that we are always thinking about, those mental health disorders, as well as hearing and vision. And being accessible means everyone. Um, so, you know, ADA stuff, you know, not just services and venues, it applies to our digital assets and our written content as well, not just the way we navigate the website. And it's really important to kind of think about that inclusion is not about giving special privileges to people. It's about making sure that those barriers don't exist in the first place. So it's sort of baking that process in from the beginning. And I, I would do a disservice if I didn't like lightly talk about terms and definitions, but I'm just going to breeze through these because I'm, I'm sure that people can look up some of this stuff on their own. Um, there's the ADA, which is the American with Disabilities Act. Um, and it pro, uh, really prohibits discrimination and guarantees that people who uh, live with disabilities have that same opportunity um, as everyone else to participate in American life, you know, employment opportunities, purchasing goods, and participating in our local governments. And then there's Section 508, we might hear that term. That um, is a procurement law. It really uh, stresses that you need to make sure that Federal agencies develop, procure, maintain, and use information and communications technology. Uh, make sure that it's accessible for people who live with disabilities. And this is regardless of not what it's regardless of whether or not everyone works for the federal government. And to be 508 compliant means that you're WCAG 2.0 compliant, which leads me into what is um, WCAG. Um, it's the web content accessibility guidelines. And it's developed with the goal of providing a single standard across um, our, for web content accessibility. It includes individuals, organizations, and governments internationally. And it's really set up for people who need that set of standards and guidelines. And it's broken down into three levels. Um, you have the A, the AA, and the AAA, and each increasing A in the level indicates an additional criteria to follow. So level A is like this minimal compliance. If, you're, if your website doesn't meet the single A, it means that it's really difficult for people with disabilities to use and access your content. Double A indicates acceptable criteria compliance and criteria, it means that your website is usable and understandable by most people. And this is um, when we hear about being 508 compliant, it really talks about being um, WCAG uh, 2.0 AA compliant. And then AAA is this optimal level of compliance. And it's a little bit harder to reach that, but it means that your website is available to the maximum number of users with or without disabilities. So if you're looking at that AAA level, it indicates the highest level of usability, not just accessibility. So remember, the more accessible our websites are, the more usable they are for everybody. And it's broken down into four principles. There's perceivable, operable, understandable, and robust. Um, and I'll just kind of break them down um, in the next couple of slides. So there's four broad parameters we consider. We need to make sure that our websites are easy to see, so we accommodate visual needs. We want to make sure that folks can interact with our website, so we accommodate uh, motor needs. We do want to make sure that people can hear or have a replacement for sound, so we accommodate auditory needs. And then we want to make sure that it's easy to understand, so we accommodate cognitive needs. We want to be sure that the experience as, is as equal as possible, regardless of things we can't control. And that means, you know, um, operating systems and, you know, people are sitting in the sun and they have a glare. So it really boils down to that usability again. So um, another definition of assistive technology, assistive technology is really, um, it's about allowing, and, uh, allowing, <laughs> allowing and empowering users who live with low vision or cognitive or learning disabilities to 
um, access the information and maintain a level of privacy. It removes a barrier to the internet or digital information. And I wanna go back to that word privacy um, because as a nurse, sometimes I would have to um, help my patients uh, access their email. Imagine how awkward it is to read an email to a, a patient from a family member that's, you know, um, that they haven't talked to in a long time. So, you know, just little things like privacy are really important to that, ac that um, aspect of accessibility. And then different types of assistive technology, and I'm just going to read these, you know, of course, you've got your screen readers, but a keyboard is assistive technology, say you don't have a mouse. Um, text to speech systems, screen magnification. This includes, you know, on your Mac, your command plus plus. Head pointers, single switch technology, um, motion tracking. It looks like I have head pointers on the slide twice, and eye tracking. And a lot of um, these um, come with people who have mobile disabilities. You know, people who who uh, live with quadriplegia. You know, and can't um, use their hands, or maybe you have a tremor. You know, things like that. So now I want to go into the, the media aspect of it um, and talk about images, because uh, this is a first, first good sort of, because um, images are so bold on our website. Um, why, do we, why do we like images? You know, um, images enhance your content, especially for people who live with cognitive or learning disabilities. Um, we include images and media to support and add to our information and concepts, you know, maybe it invokes an emotion. Um, and folks who live with low vision use images as cues to help orient it, orient themselves on the page. And media, including social media, use images for conversions, you know, if you want to break it down to a business uh, level. Um, having images on our social media posts or in our posts in general lead to a higher click through rate and ROI, which means return on investment, you know, people are more likely to click on your on your tweet if you have an have an image. And then you know images can be huge barriers when they're not accessible um, accessible images benefit um, people using screen readers you know the text alternative can be read aloud or rendered as braille and reusable braille devices uh, they can have uh, accessible images can help people using speech input software you know users can put the focus on a button or a linked image with the single voice command Text alternatives can be read for people browsing using those speech enabled websites. Um, mobile web users, you know, images can be turned off, especially if you have data roaming and people who have poor internet connections. So without that alt text, they don't know what's going on. And then remember, um, make having accessible uh, images is good for your SEO, for your search engine optimization, because now those images are indexable because the search engines can now find them because they've been translated into text. So again, you know, good accessibility is good usability. Um, and there's different image types which we add to our sites. I'm going to focus um, on simple images, complex images, images of text, groups of images, and, and image maps in the next few slides. So a simple image. Um, this is an image that conveys um, simple information and you can use uh they can be described with alternative text sometimes we call it alt text you know and for a simple image we want our alt text to be short and sweet in a description of the content of the image um and keep in mind that it's typically invisible to people who can see the image but the alt text is exposed to people who use alternative uh or assistive technologies you know um, the screen readers and the braille devices um the description in these simple images should convey the content and functionality of the image as concisely as possible to provide your basic access to the content without adding a ton of details. So this image would be, you know, um, a front fender of a yellow Volkswagen with a silver bumper, you know, just something that conveys that basic information. We have complex images. Uh, these are things like graphs or diagrams, you know, um, images that contain too much information to 
really be effectively described using that alt text I talked about in the last slide. So instead, these images are described with long descriptions. You know, a long description is a more detailed description that provides more or less an equivalent access to the information on the image. You have to think, um, given the current context, what information is this image intended to communicate? And that same information should be provided to people who can't see the image. You know, a long description um, can also include structure necessary to communicate the content. You know, um, if it's a graph, you know, or a, or a chart, make sure, or a table, you have headings um, and data tables and lists. So, you know, the alt image of this, uh, the long description of this uh, diagram would um, describe the Volkswagen and it would also include all of those details that we see, you know, it's in German, so I don't know what it says, but you would include all of those things, you know, you'd say uh, the description pointing to the tire, you know, so you just make sure that if there's information that you need your reader to have that all of that's presented either within the content of the page or in that long description. Now a decorative image, you know, these are purely decorative. They don't convey any meaning. And there's a, a couple of different things that you can do, um, several methods that, that can tell screen readers to ignore the image. Um, images are sometimes decorative when they're used for like styling around borders or spacers and corners. Um, they're illustrative of text, maybe, but they're not contributing any information. Um, but I do have something to say about decorative images. And this isn't any AA compliance or anything. This is coming from my heart, is that if we use decorative images to convey or evoke emotion, we're doing our content consumers a disservice by not describing that image to them. Because there's, if, 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 that, if that imagery is the emo, you know, uh, provides that emotion that you need to continue with the story or call to action, um, you should really describe that to, to, your, to your audience. Um, images of text, uh, readable text is sometimes presented within the image itself. You know, um, if the image is not a logo, you should really avoid using images and text. But if you do use it, we want to make sure that the images of text, um, the alt text should contain the same words as the image. Um, and the reason why we don't really want to use that is when we use actual text, the text is more flexible than images. You can resize it in the browser without it losing clarity. Um, you know, and background and text colors can be modified to suit the reading preferences of the users. Um, images can really become distorted as we zoom in and out, you know, in, so with saying that, if you have situations where images of text can't be avoided, make sure that that alt text contains the exact um, text is in the image. And groups of images. Um, we're using a star rating system here in this image, you know, overall satisfaction rating. So if you have multiple images that convey a single piece of information, the text alternative for one of the images should convey all the information for the entire group. So this group of five stars um, all combined make that product rating. So there's uh, five stars altogether. Three of them are filled in, and one of them is a quarter of the way filled in. The text alternative for the very first image would read rating 3.25 out of five stars. And then all of the other images would have a null attribute. Um, so you just need to describe the group of images in that first image. Image maps, these are uh, pictures and images that contain uh, more than one or multiple clickable areas, you know, this can be park maps, it can be decision trees, it can be organizational charts. And the text alternative for an image that contains lots of multiple clickable areas should provide overall context for the for that whole set of links. And then individually, you should describe the clickable area and it should describe the purpose or destination of the link. So you have one that describes the whole image and then you have the individual ones. And remember, if these are 
um, multiple clickable areas, you want to make sure that you describe the purpose of where the user is going when they click that link. And you know, remember images can be used as links, you know, for pagination or anchor links, you know, to get to different places in the page. Um, we use images for logos, they can be decorative. Um, images can improve usability by making orientation and interaction or uh, interactive elements easy to recognize and use. But we do need to be careful when creating alt attributes for image links. This goes back to that last slide of the multiple clickable images because the alt text now has two requirements. It describes the image and it describes where the, it tells the user where activating the link will go. And I say that because that's important. That's why I say it twice. So we have images and sometimes we have clients and people who really love to use slideshows. Um, Lots of times slideshows are you know, really prominent on our web pages. They're used to provide navigation or show page content. You know, they're right in your face. Um, a slideshow can display a few items one at a time. You know, um, some folks call them carousels or sliders. Uh, typical uses of slideshows include um, scrolling news headlines, uh, featured articles on home pages and image galleries. Um, I do want to mention that according to W3 schools, and I have a quote um, that I've memorized that slideshows are disputed from a usability perspective because their content can be hard to discover. Um, and it goes back to that ensuring accessibility can improve usability too. So from a usability point of view, slideshows are kind of cruddy, you know, um, but we all have those uh, clients and people who love them. So I talk about them a little bit. So how do we make slideshows more accessible? Um, we style the carousel to make sure that it's usable. You know, we you if we use um, animations between items, make sure that our consumers can stop pause and resume those animations. Uh, we wanna make sure that people can turn the player off. Um, we wanna provide visible controls um, that are accessible to the keyboard, mouse, and touch. And we wanna be sure that those controls are highlighted on focus when we're hovering or when we've clicked down to that interactive element. And we wanna make sure that there's no keyboard traps. You know, If you can get into the slideshow, we wanna make sure that we can get out of the slideshow by the same method we got in. So if we keyboard into a slideshow, we wanna make sure that we can keyboard out. Um, and make sure that the colors are visible. You know, um, Remember that size and color and take into account that the background color can change. So I have a picture of a Volkswagen up here and you can see that um, the left hand um, navigation button is really hard to see against that background. So be mindful of where you place your controls and that those background images can change. And again, you know, you wanna make sure that there's a reasonable alternative to the slideshow. Um, your slideshow doesn't have to work if people have their style sheets turned off, but we want to make sure that the content is still available. So if you turn off your images, you know, it goes back to all of the images and you turn off your slideshows, can you still be able to find all the information, you know, turn off your CSS, turn off your JavaScript, can people still access all that information? Moving parts to a website. Um, Having content that blinks for more than five seconds can be distracting for some folks. And for certain groups of people, including people with low literacy or reading and intellectual dis disabilities and um, people with attention deficit disorders, content that blinks can make it really difficult and sometimes almost impossible for them to interact with the rest of the web page. Um, and they'll sometimes leave. So I want to go a little into moving parts of a, of a web page. Um, so content that moves or auto updates can be a barrier to anyone who has trouble reading stationary text quickly. 
um, because it might disappear off the screen before they're ready for it. It can also cause problems for screen readers if the content disappears before the, the, the screen reader has read all the information. Um, Form notices, you know, a form blinks an arrow near the submit form. If the user fit, you know, finishes filling out the form but does not activate uh, the submit button, the blinking needs to really stop after five seconds. Loading animations, you know, we see those little Ajax spinners, you know, it's a, a preloader animation can sometimes appear on a page when um, a certain percentage of a file is being downloaded before the, the player, um, the playback can begin. So we need to be mindful of that motion. Um, web advertisements, you know, um, sometimes we have advertisements that blink to get a uh, viewer's attention. We really need to make sure that that stops after five seconds as well. Uh, stock tickers, you know, these are news tickers or stock tickers that we see at the bottom of the screen or sometimes like going through the website, you know, making sure that we're able to pause the ticker um, so we can view, uh, view the information at a pace that makes sense to us. So those are some examples of moving parts. Um, autoplay, uh, we see this a lot in our uh, links and social media and on web pages too, you know, where our YouTube videos play automatically. Um, we want to make sure that there's a method that's provided to, again, pause, stop, or hide any media that, um, that begins playing automatically that lasts more than five seconds. And that's the rule. Five seconds or more, you need to have a, a, a pause, stop, or hide uh, uh, choice for your, for your consumers. So let's look at videos, you know, how are people consuming your videos and how is your audience consuming videos, you know, how do you consume a video. Captions are um, should really be provided on all videos, you know, those are text versions of the audio content that's usually synchronized with the with the video. And there are a lot of situations that benefit from captions. You know, there's loud environments like at the airport or noisy co-working spaces where you can't hear the audio. There's silent environments like quiet co-working spaces or you have a sleeping baby where you don't want the sound to be turned on and you can't find your headphones. Um, sometimes content that's written can be better understood by people um, or sometimes content, let's, how do I want to word this? Sorry. Um, sometimes content can be better understood by people hearing and seeing the information. For example, people who are not native speakers to the language. So having um, having that backup of having the words, you know, in case they don't always uh, catch everything. And for some folks, you know, it's easier and quicker to read um, than watch videos because they'll play the videos at like one and a half speed or something like that. Uh, content in text form, such as caption files and transcripts, again, just like images, they're now better indexed by search engines, so all of your audio content is now uh, searchable by text. And then um, we want to make sure that our captions are accurate. You know, not only is it a good idea, but when you're providing content for universities, it's required that your captions be accurate. So it's okay during live presentations, but making sure that once it's on the internet for longevity, going back and editing those captions and making sure that they're accurate. And that includes adding punctuation, um, uh, uh, misspelling, things like that, adding, uh, uh, names are typically misspelled. Drupal is hardly ever spelled right, you know. So sometimes you'll, once you get into a routine of um, editing your videos, you'll you'll recognize what words are spelled wrong. Then it makes it a little bit easier. Um, captions uh, should include other audio content as well, things like dog barking or music playing, anything that adds value to the information. Um, and to talk a little bit more about captions, captions can be either open or closed. Closed captions, um, you have the ability to turn on and off. Like if you're streaming Netflix, you can turn those captions on and off. Whereas open captions, um, they're always visible. Open captions allows for more control over the caption location, size, color, font, and all, the timing, all of those things. Um, but closed captions are most common because they it utilizes the functionality within video players. Um, and again, you can turn it on and off because sometimes um, open captions might uh, uh, be in the way of important um, visual information. So if you have closed caption, you can toggle it on and off to be able to see the visual information. 
audio descriptions are separate narrative audio tracks that describe important visual content, making it accessible to people who can't see the video. So um, with that in mind, when you have visual content, if it if it's conveyed through audio, then you don't need um, to add audio descriptions. And then transcripts. Uh, transcripts is the text version of the media content and a transcript should really capture all of the spoken audio plus any on screen text um, descriptions of key information that you wouldn't otherwise be um, able to access without seeing the video. Um, transcripts also provide an important part of making multimedia content accessible. Again, it goes back to that now that your, your, your visual and your audio content is translated into text, now it's search engine uh, searchable. Um, and transcripts don't have to be word for word, but they should contain um, additional descriptions, explanations, um, things like laughter or explosions. Um, another benefit of transcriptions is uh, users of assistive technology like refreshable Braille, you know, they now that it's in text form that that Braille device can work. And users of screen readers prefer transcripts because they can read much faster than the video plays, allowing them to get through the content um, quicker. And being hard of hearing, this is something I've only developed in the last three years. I appreciate transcripts because captions fall off of the screen. And sometimes I don't realize I've missed information until the captions are already gone. Where transcripts, if they're live, I can go back and search that text and make sure that I processed all the information. It's, it's preference, but that's, that's why I like transcripts over uh, captioning. Media players. So um, choosing an accessible media player, you know, um, if you work for a university, sometimes you only have a few choices, um, but you work for an agency or on your own or you're managing your family's website, you have more choice over what kind of player you can use. So I'm going to go through a couple of the things that I think about when I choose a media player. Are closed captions supported? Um, you know, making sure that because not all YouTube players are created equal. Some will have captions and some will not. Um, does the media player support audio descriptions in a way that enables my content users to toggle the narration on and off? Again, um, especially on the size of your screen on your mobile, sometimes those uh, captions can get in the way of the visual and sometimes it's nice to toggle them on, in, on and off. Um, can the, the player's buttons and controls be operated without a mouse? Can I access all the information using my keyboard alone or my single switch device? Um, are the media player's buttons and controlled um, controls labeled so people who are using assistive technology are able to parse what's going on? You know, do they know that it's the play button? Do they know that it's a stop button? And can your media player fully function, including all of the accessibility features across platforms and across all major browsers? Um, remember that some assistive tech works best in certain operating systems. And depending on your agency or, or you know, what content management system you use, um, get a list of uh, what what criteria and what browsers you need to support. You know, you could have an Internet Explorer on that list, you know, and making sure that that player works in Internet Explorer is just as important if it works in Google or in Chrome. So responsive design. I like to talk about this because we're all on our phones. You know, we, we well, not all of us, but most of us are on our phones. You know, in the Bay Area, when we're commuting, we're on the Cal train, we're on the BART, you know, we're waiting at the coffee shop. Um, nowadays in COVID, we're placing our orders online. You know, we're, we're interacting uh, quite a bit more um, using our phones. So we need to make sure that we have responsive designs. And the smartphone market in the US is one of the world's largest markets um, with more than 260 million people using smartphones. Um, and the estimate is over 80% of the world population uses a cell phone. So those are huge numbers. So we wanna make sure that we provide um, provide the same services and make sure we're accessible across our mobile devices too. Um, so we wanna make sure that our buttons um, 
provide large click targets, you know, uh, the links, the buttons, the controls for users whose movements um, are difficult to control. You know, those little itty bitty X's we see, we want to make sure that those are actually usable for people. Um, people who have tremors or spasms need to be able to activate those targets on the web page, including on their phone. So making sure that you increase the target size for these users can really maximize their chances of accurately selecting the target on the web page. Because I don't know about you, but I constantly pressing something I don't want to press and not knowing how to get out of an ad or something like that. Um, Perhaps the images are turned off, so we want to make sure that the buttons also have sufficient text elements and are easy to access as well, because not all of us um, live in places where we have good data and you know we're we're roaming and so it, it benefits us to have our, our our images turned off on our phones. And we want to make sure that our content is not restricted to a single orientation, such as portrait or landscape, unless it's essential, you know, make sure that when you're testing on your phone that the content can go both ways. Um, make sure that you don't have to scroll in both directions because sometimes you can't get to all of the content if you have to scroll vertically and horizontally at the same time. And then there's some other considerations. Um, we want to make sure that the control mechanisms can be activated with gestures, movements, and voice because not all of us um, access information in the same way. Um, again, back to the layouts um, and responsive design for our mobile devices, we want to make sure that, um, well, we want to think about multi-column layout because that doesn't always work on a narrow screen. For, um, for example, the text size may need to be increased so it's more legible. Um, and most of these issues can be solved by creating responsive layout. Um, using techniques like viewports and flex boxes or media queries. And think about high resolution. Um, many mobile devices have high resolution screens, so we need to make sure that um, our images um, have higher resolutions. That way the display can look can continue to have that crisp, sharp look that we have on our desktop computers. Zooming in and out, you know, using our viewports, you know, is it possible to disable zoom? You know, always ensure that resizing is enabled and set to the width of the device, uh, the device's width. Um, and again, think about scrolling. You know, you don't want to scroll up and horizontal at the same time. Um, can text be resized and does it wrap? You know, um, we look at our menus, you know, making sure that the controls uh, you can you can access the controls, you know, the hamburger menu, is it big enough? And, you know, are is your drop down um, uh, displayed in a way that makes sense? And then user input, you know, inputting data uh, tends to be a little annoying um, on the phone versus the desktop. So we want to try to make the experience equivalent. Um, you know, it's worth trying to minimize the amount of typing needing needed when you're on a phone. So think about that when you have forms on when people are using mobile devices, you know, can, you know, is it cumbersome? Do they have to scroll down a huge form? Um, would it be easier to separate each question into a page when you're on the phone? Little things like that. Um, time restraints. These in more normal times really bug me because, um, I buy a lot of concert tickets. I really like to go and see live music and I like a lot of popular live music. And you go on to Live Nation or Ticketmaster or any of those, or even buying Giants tickets and you're, you're, you're limited by time, you know? So if possible, elements shouldn't have a, a, a time limit. You know, we wanna really allow users to use media at their own pace. You know, if a time limit needs to be in place, for example, for like security reasons, the user should have the ability to turn it off and, or extend the time. Um, unfortunately, this restriction doesn't apply to the time limit if it's due to a live event, like an auction or a game, you know, um, or if, the, but think about those, those instances where you limit the time to complete a form and the form is um, essential for valid submissions. And the, the, the example I use is um, me trying to um, 
buy a ticket, you know, like Grateful Dead tickets or something like that. And I go on my phone and I, and I'm upstairs and I'm doing it. And then, oh no, my wallet's downstairs. So I have to go downstairs. And then when I'm downstairs, I've tripped over the dog or the kid needs help with the homework. And by the time I get to my phone upstairs again, the time limit is gone. I have to go back in the queue and wait. And then I don't get the good seats. And that's just from like a usability point of view, you know, think about people who, um, might have a palsy and take longer to interact with their phone, you know, um, it really comes down to making sure that people have equivalent experiences, you know, across across of all of our medias. So I'm almost at time. So um, I kind of went through those really fast. But now what, you know, what can we do now? You know, um, we want to make sure that we work with our team. If we have a team, you know, we want to utilize everyone's strengths and i also want to challenge folks that work for an agency or own or own teams and products to make accessibility something that's cross team that everyone has a role in accessibility um not just our qa people at the end but our designers are designing for accessibility our developers are keeping in mind accessibility our content editors are are trained in accessibility, because remember, content is entered at all parts of the website. And if you if you fix accessibility issues at the design phase, it doesn't go all the way through. So baking accessibility into your workflow saves time and money in the long run. Um, so communication is key. You know, um, more. This is this slide's more about. Um, uh, after your website is developed and you have content authors in there. And I always like to say that your content authors are very valuable to your website because they're in there day to day. Many times after your web team has finished, you know, they're in there, they're creating the content. And it's just as important for you to train your content people on accessibility as it is to train your designers and your developers. So what we can do is we can, again, utilize everyone's skill set. We can set up style guides and style sheets, you know, use pattern libraries, um, ensure that our uh, WYSIWYGs are what you see is what you get. Your editors have tooltips and everyone is trained on how to use them. Um, we make sure that we have accessible fonts and color contrast baked into our WYSIWYGs, you know, kind of limit those controls. But if you do have all the bells and whistles, just make sure that folks are trained on that. And remember that accessibility is a moving target. Just because your site is compliant today doesn't mean that it will be tomorrow, especially after that content um, is uh, entered. And then here's my thank you slide. Um, again, I'm at Volkswagen Chick um, in most of the spaces, and Volkswagen is spelled with an E, V O L K W A G E N C H I C K. Um, and then um, there is that link in the chat for my slide deck because at the end of the slide deck, I have not only like um, credits for my photos, but I also have uh, a few different resources and different tools that I use to help with accessibility. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen, maybe. I can find the button. And I'll take questions if anyone has questions. Thank you, and Amy June, that was lovely. I think, Thanks. Cynthia, you had a question? Are you still here? I did. Thank you, Amy. That was a lot of information. It was really, really good. I did actually, I have a question. I'm not sure if it's accessible media, but um, we have a lot of, um, when we talk about high res images, I'm wondering if you recommend uploading multiple images, if there's a high res option and then like social, a lot of social platforms can only accept like you know, maybe a five megabyte kind of size. So how do you, um, uh, what do you suggest people do to handle that kind of? I do, um, I work mostly in the Drupal space. So I know that Drupal has um, extendability for images. There's like responsive image um, modules and some of it's ba being baked into core, but I definitely recommend um, uh, uh, different image sizes loaded. And then when you title your images, making sure that it's clear to the content people who are adding those images, which images are, are appropriate, like including it sometimes in your, in your, um, in the, the, you know, the file name, you know, 
saying mm -hmm. large or small or thumbnail really helps um, with some people being able to, to, to determine which images are which, so. Awesome, thank you. But yeah, Martin answers the question that there is something in core that will change those images if you're using Drupal. Like I said, I'm not too familiar right. with WordPress and the other CMSs to know that, so. Yeah, I'm not worried about changing the size in Drupal. I'm, I, you know, that's that's fine. But um, we find that people have to upload. It's like another field. You know, you'd have your field for your image that's represented on the site, and then the field that represents the page that gets shared when you're sharing a URL in social. Mm -hmm. It will grab that image, but it won't grab the image if it's too large. <laughs> yeah. so. and, and we and we do have to be mindful of how many images we load too, depending on yeah. like adding bloat to your site, right? You know, so keeping your files down sometimes um, is important. It depends on like how much you have going on, you know. So, um, sort of a caveat there. Awesome. Thank you. You're welcome. So we're at time. Um, I am giving a presentation tomorrow. Um, uh, that sort of ties into the last slide I had about accessibility being a moving target, where I talk about things that are coming up next and what we can do to future proof our websites for when guidelines and, and um, guidelines and standards change over time and talk about different team strategies we can do um, to bake accessibility into our workflow. Thank you, Amy June. We look forward to seeing you again tomorrow. Okay. Thanks, Carol. Really appreciate you coming and presenting here today.